a very good evening friends i welcome you all to the hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by the shankar ias academy today's date is 19th october 2023 displayed here are the news articles which we are going to discuss today so without wasting time let us get into the discussion look at this news article the prohibition of child marriage amendment bill 2021 was previously sent to the standing committee of women children for its effective review the standing committee has requested several extensions to finalize and submit the report in this news article it states that the committee has been given additional 3 months extension to finalize the report see this is the crux of the article so in this context let us see how to cover the important topic parliamentary committee for our prelims examination friends you know this list of parliamentary committee is so big and it will be difficult to cover everything within a short video so i will cover only a sub topic that is financial committee in this news article discussion but i will do it in a manner which you can use and study other committees for your examination purposes so in our discussion we shall discuss how to prepare this chapter for our preliminary examination let us take financial committee for example friends i will use a template to cover the financial committees you can use the same template to cover other parliamentary committees for your examination you know the financial committee comprises of three committees it is public accounts committee committee on estimates and the committee on public undertakings so in our prelims examination questions regarding the financial committees can be asked from the following areas like when it was established members of the committee on how they are selected and finally the functions of the committee questions in this topic can be only asked from this area let us discuss them firstly let us discuss the time of establishment see the public accounts committee was set up in 1921 under the provisions of the government of india act 1919 and since has been in existence the estimate committee can be traced back to the standing financial committee which was set up in 1921 after independence it was established in 1950 on the recommendation of the john mathai who was the then finance minister The Committee of Public Undertakings was established in 1964 on the recommendation of Krishnan Menon Committee. See, this is about the first parameter that is time of establishment. Let us take the second parameter that is the membership of the committee and how these members are getting selected. Here, first let us take the Public Accounts Committee. See, Public Accounts Committee or PAC has 22 members in total. Out of these 22 members, 15th will be from the Lok Sabha and 7th will be from the Rajya Sabha. These members are elected by the parliament every year from among its own members. They are elected according to the principle of proportional representation by single transferable vote. The term of the office is one year and the chairman of the PAC is appointed by the speaker from among its members. See, since 1967, there has been a convention that the chairman of the public accounts committee should be from the opposition party but note that the chairman should be only from the lok sabha and a minister cannot be the part of this committee let us move on to the next committee that is estimate committee see ec has 30 members and you know that all these 30 members should be from the lok sabha see the rajya sabha has no representation in the estimate committee see the members of the ec also should be selected according to the proportional representation system by single transferable vote the term of the office is one year like pac a minister cannot be a member of ec the chairman of the estimation committee is appointed by the speaker from among its members and the chairman will be from the ruling party finally let us take the committee on public undertakings cpu the cpu has 22 members and here also 15 will be from lok sabha and 7 will be from rajya sabha see they are elected according to the proportional representative system by single transferable vote the term of the office is one year and the chairman of the cpu is also appointed by the speaker but note that the chairman should be from lok sabha also a minister cannot be the member of pac see we have covered the structural part of the committees here you should focus on the things which are common to all and you should also focus on the unique part of each committees okay let us move on to the functional part of the committees the main function of the pac is to examine the annual audit reports of the comptroller and auditor general of india 
these reports as we know are being laid before the parliament by the president of india the committee examines the public expenditure not only from the legal point of view but also from the point of view of economy prudence and wisdom okay moving on to the estimate committee the main function of the committee is to examine the estimates which are included in the budget and suggest measure to improve the economic efficiency of the public expenditure finally coming to the cpu or committee on public undertakings its main function is to examine the reports of the cag on public undertakings it also examines whether the psu are managed according to the sound business principles and prudent commercial practices see this is all about the functions of the committees friends this template lets you cover all the preliminary related facts for mains you must add one more subheading like effectiveness of the committee if there is any lacune in their working process what are the reasons behind that this is sufficiently enough to cover both preliminary and mains examination related facts friends you can use this template to cover all the other committees as well this will help you to cover the topics effectively and will also aid you in quickly revising the topics see this is all regarding this discussion look at this news article this news article talks about the recent visit of congress leaders to the ramappa temple in telangana so in this context let us cover some prelims related facts about the ramappa temple see ramappa temple is very important for the preliminary examination because recently this temple was inscribed as the india's 39th unesco world heritage site see usually temples are being named after the main deity of the temple but this temple got its name from the main sculpture ramappa who is the sculpture of this temple perhaps this is the only temple in india which was named after the main sculpture of the temple see this temple is also called as kakatiya rudreshwara temple the main deity lord shiva is in the form of rama lingeshwara know this the temple complex was built during the kakatiya period which is 1123 to 1323 common era it was built mainly under the rulers rudra deva and recharla rudra see it took more than 40 years to build this temple with this brief introduction let us see some important features of the temple first let us see the materials which are being used in the construction of this temple this temple complex is built using an amalgamation of various materials let us see them here the temple is built with sandstones the beams and pillars are made of carved granites and dolerite know that dolerite is a medium grained dark intrusive igneous rock this rock is extremely hard and tough since the beams and pillars are being made using this rock they have a metal like finish finally coming to vimana the vimana is built using lightweight porous bricks also known as floating bricks the next important feature is the construction technique which is being used in this temple see this temple is built on a 6 feet high platform using the sandbox techniques generally this temple has structures like garbhagraha antarala and maha mandaba the temple is surrounded by pradikshina pada then at the entrance there is nandi mandaba here the main temple is being surrounded by a wall you would have heard that i have i have mentioned about sandbox technique let's see what is that see in this technique first a hole is dug up for laying the foundations of the temple the hole is then being filled with a mixture of sand lime and jaggery which is used for binding of the materials and more often karakaya a black myrobalan fruit is also being used overall this is called a sandbox and it acts as a foundation of the temple it is over this foundation the very heavy construction of the temple is being made this techniques provide earthquake resistance to the temple see in normal constructions we make sure that the foundation is strong enough to bear the weight of the construction but the kakatiyas used sand as a foundation material so that it works like a cushion the sandbox can absorb stress from all the sides so that when an earthquake occurs the trimmer lost most of the strength by the time when it reaches the construction of the sandbox so when an earthquake occurs 
the trimmer lost most of its strength by the time it reaches the construction as the trimmers are being observed by the sandbox see this basic points are very important for our preliminary examination because there is always a possibility of question like where the description and unique points of the temple which will be given and we will be asked to identify the temple so keep revising the points which we have discussed and you will clearly ask this question so with this learned points about ramappa temple let us take up the next news article for our discussion take a look at this opinion page article this article talks about the necessity of women's participation in the workforce of india by doing so we can achieve a 5 trillion economy see in india there is a family structure where often fathers work outside the home and mothers provide child and elderly care but this model is not conducive to the india's growing economic ambitions especially attaining a 5 trillion dollar economy why it is so imagine half of your eligible population is not participating in the workforce and wherever they are participating they are not giving an economic value to it if we are doing this mistake then how can we achieve our stated objective of being a developed country this article highlights two specific ways to achieve this objective first way is to appropriately value the women's work which often involves care giving second way is to provide an adequate support to the women to participate in the economic activity outside of their households see this is the crux of the article which is being given here so in our today's discussion let us try to understand some of the important points mentioned here using a mains question let me read out the question for you distinguish between care economy and monetized economy how can a care economy be brought under the monetized economy through the empowerment of women see this question was asked in the gs paper 3 in upsc mains 2023 this was asked for a 15 marker with a word limit of 250 words now let us try to answer this question see this question is a very straightforward and specific question so in introduction part you can write about what is care economy and a monetized economy for example you can write that care economy includes invisible unpaid or underpaid activities like taking care of children taking care of elderly doing household chores etc on the other hand monetized economy involves a formal paid economic activities traditionally women have been the primary drivers of the care economy so empowering women is essential to integrate the care economy into a monetized economy you can write this as an introduction guys if you have an alternate intro feel free to write and post it in our comment section now let us move on to the body part of the question see this question can be split into two parts in the first part you can write the differences between the care and monetized economy guys while presenting it if you present the points in a tabular format you can save time and words by giving a neat presentation and remember that tabulation will also convey your thoughts more easily to the evaluator then in the second part of your answer you can write certain point to say that how the care and economy can be brought into a monetized economy through women empowerment this is how we are going to approach this question so let us start with the first part of the body firstly you can say about the care economy you can write points like firstly the nature of the work includes unpaid or underpaid care giving nurturing or domestic work example nursing housewives etc secondly the value of work done is not measured in the monetary terms it focuses on the social and emotional well-being of the family thirdly historically it is associated with the woman thus contributing to the gender disparities fourthly it is often undervalued and lacks recognition in the traditional economic framework for example it is not included in the calculation of gdp fifthly it is dedicated to the well-being of the society and communities with an emphasis on the improving the quality of life and fostering social connections finally care economy is crucial for individual and societal well-being keeping the family structures intact and leading to the cohesion of communities within the society this is all about the care economy points 
Now let us see about the monetized economy. You can write the points here. Like it is a it is a formal paid work in industries, businesses and services etc. The value of work done is directly measured in terms of currency and it is being compensated monetarily. See, it increases the gender inclusivity with more women participate in the formal workforce. It is central to the economic systems with monetary valuation and formal recognitions. For example, it is mostly accounted in the GDP calculations. Fifthly, it is frequently driven by the pursuit of profit, competition and the goal of economic expansion. Finally, it drives economic growth, income generation, infrastructure development and technological advancements. So you can write this point in the first part and then move on to the second part of your answer. In the second part of your answer, you should write about how the care economy can be brought into the monetized economy through the empowerment of women. You can write the points like bringing policy reforms and implementing the policies that acknowledges and values the unpaid care work of the woman. For example, MG Narega is also providing wages for certain community and care related activity. Secondly, encouraging the businesses to offer flexible work arrangements that accommodating the women's caregiving responsibilities. For example, remote work or part-time opportunities can enable the woman to balance work and caregiving. Thirdly, providing training and skill development tailoring to the needs of the woman. For example, programs that train women as a healthcare workers, educators or caregivers can lead to the formal employment. Then increase the formation of self-help groups among the women. These groups can engage in economic activities collectively like micro enterprises or agricultural cooperatives etc. A good example of this is a Kudumbashri model in Kerala or Jeevika in Bihar. Then moving on in our discussion, enhancing the maternity and child care benefits to support the working mothers like expanding the maternity leave provisions and affordable child care facilities can enable the woman to return to the workforce. Then promoting entrepreneurship among women in the sectors of care economy by encouraging them to establish the small businesses like daycare centers, nursing services or home health care agencies. For example, the Indian government offers Nari Shakti grants to empower women entrepreneurs across various sectors. Finally, you should write about implementing the 5R framework of the International Labour Organization. The ILO proposes a 5R framework for a decent care work which is centered around achieving a goal of gender equality. Guys, you can write all these points in the second part of your answer. Finally, in the conclusion, you can write that by empowering women through education, entrepreneurship and policy support, India can successfully bring the care economy into the fold of monetized economy. This not only advances the gender equality but also boosts economic growth by leveraging the significant caregiving contribution of the woman. Guys, this can be your conclusion. If you have an alternative one, feel free to write and post it in our comment section so that there will be a win-win situation for all of us. This is all about this news discussion. With this learned points, let us take up the next article for our discussion. Look at this news article. Recently, the central government has increased the minimum support price or MSP for Robbie crops. But the farmers group are not happy with the increase in MSP. They argue that the rise in MSP does not match us with the rising input cost of production. So in this context, let us discuss about the basics of MSP. See, this topic is very important for both our prelims and mains examination. So we can have a 360 degree approach about the topic. See, firstly, let us see the basics of MSP. See, MSP is a form of market intervention by the government of India. This is done to protect the farmers against any sharp fall in the farm prices. It is usually announced by the government at the beginning of the sowing season. See, MSP is announced for certain category of crops on the basis of the recommendations of Commission for Agricultural Cost and Prices, that is CACP. Here, have a look at the determinants of MSP which is used by CACP. I have displayed here, you can see it. See, you need not memorize any of them. 
but be aware of the factors in case if it is asked in the examination you can use it for elimination purposes on continuing our discussion see in simple words this msp which is the price fixed by the government of india to protect the farmers against excessive fall in the price during the bumper production years on the other hand it is also a minimum guarantee for the producers during the lean or drought seasons the major objective of the msp is to support the farmers from distress sale and to procure food grains for the public distribution let us see how this msp is being useful to the farmers see in the case the market price for the commodity falls below the announced minimum price due to bumper production and there is a mismatch in the market government agencies purchase the entire quantity offered by the farmers at the announced minimum price this is how farmers are being protected from the mismatch of supply and demand of the market now let us see the crops that are being covered under the msp see government announces minimum support prices or msp for 22 mandated crops and a fair and remunerative price or frp for sugarcane so on the whole 22 plus 1 or 23 crops are being given under msp production among these 22 crops 14 crops belong to the karif season 6 crops belong to the rabi season and 2 crops are belong to the other commercial crops here i have displayed the list of crops which are being covered under msp just go through this list of crops and you need not memorize any of them we have discussed the mechanism for the determination of msp see there is also an another mechanism to calculate the minimum support price this was given by the eminent agricultural scientist dr ms swaminathan who passed away recently here the national commission for farmers or ncf was constituted in 2004 under the chairmanship of ms swaminathan this is famously called swaminathan formula the swaminathan commission recommended that the msp shall be calculated by adding 50 percentage profit to the c2 cost here what do you mean by c2 crop it means comprehensive cost including the imputed value of family labor this is called c2 plus 50 percentage formula the commission also suggested expanding the scope of msp to cover a wide range of agricultural producers including the crops like ginger garlic turmeric etc so here we have discussed the basic information regarding the minimum support price now let us see the advantages and disadvantages of msp you can use this points for the enrichment of your answer here coming to advantages firstly it deals with a price stability msp provides price stability and a guaranteed income for farmers reducing their income volatility and financial risk secondly msp gives income support msp acts as a safety net for farmers ensuring that they receive a minimum price for their crops whatever be the climatic or market situations can be thirdly msp provides food security to the country msp secure a consistent supply of essential food grains which are crucial for the food security of india fourthly msp aids in the rural development of india msp supports rural development by increasing the income of farmers their households which in turn boost rural consumption and economic growth lastly msp aids in the agricultural diversification here msp encourages the cultivation of diverse crops by providing the price incentives and support so this helps to reduce the dependence on few stable crops here we have discussed some of the benefits of msp now we shall see the issues which are being associated with msp firstly price distortion msp are often set at the levels which are significantly higher than the prevailing market prices it leads to the distortions in the market this can effectively discourage the private sector participation in the procurement of the crops and it will lead to a distortion of market forces the second issue is with the limited coverage of the msp the msp system primarily covers a few major crops leaving many crops and commodity outside of its purview so this can lead to the neglect of these crops and impact the income of the farmers who are dependent on them the third major issue is regional disparity see msp are often more beneficial to the farmers in certain states and regions leading to the regional disparities 
within the agricultural income of the country fourthly procurement and storage challenges the government's procurement and storage infrastructure are very inadequate in storing the crops which are being procured under msp so this leads to the issue of inefficiency wastage and corruption in the procurement process lastly inequitable benefits the benefits of msp do not always reach marginal or small farmers they often lack access to the procurement centers and faces challenges in selling their produces at msp rates so these are all some of the important issues related to minimum support price so in this news article discussion we saw about the basics of msp the determinants of msp the crops which are being covered under msp and we also saw about an alternative mechanism proposed by mr swaminathan and we also discussed about the pros and cons of the msp so please revise this often and it will be very helpful for your examination process so with this learned points let us take up the next news article for our discussion look at this news article this article talks about the hydrogen equipment manufacturing so according to the india hydrogen alliance india's domestic hydrogen market will reach 45 to 50 billion dollars by 2030 see this growth is expected to make india a supply chain hub in the green hydrogen manufacturing see this is all about the news article in this context let us see in our discussion about the basics of the green hydrogen see you all must have heard about the statement hydrogen is a clean fuel have you ever wondered why it is said so this is because hydrogen on combustion releases only steam or water vapor as a by product look at this reaction here two moles of hydrogen reacts with one moles of oxygen to give electrical energy and only water as a by product see this is how the combustion of hydrogen is taking place it is due to this only hydrogen is being considered as a clean fuel okay is it that easy to produce hydrogen see there is also a catch the thing is the elemental hydrogen rarely occurs naturally on the earth this is because hydrogen is very light and it is very being reactive so we have to produce hydrogen in a artificial manner see you all would have been aware of the various color codedness of the hydrogen like you would have read in the newspaper like green hydrogen blue hydrogen etc see all these color codedness are based on the mode of production of the hydrogen let us see them one by one see it is called green hydrogen when the hydrogen is being produced from the natural gas here you would have seen the prefix gray is being added because in this production method greenhouse gases ghg are being emitted see the second type of hydrogen it is called blue hydrogen why it is called so because here the carbon emission which are being associated with the hydrogen they are being captured and stored so in this aspect blue hydrogen is cleaner than the gray hydrogen the last important one is green hydrogen it is the cleanest form of hydrogen This is because the hydrogen is produced using the energy which are being generated using renewable sources like wind and solar energies etc. So in the case of green hydrogen in both the hydrogen production stage and the consumption stage there is zero emission. See this is why many countries are trying to add green hydrogen as part of their energy mix. Having said this on its part India has also adopted national green hydrogen mission. to become the global production hub for the green hydrogen with this introduction now let us see some facts about national green hydrogen mission this topic is very important from our prelims perspective let us get into the topic see ministry of new and renewable energy mnre will be responsible for the overall coordination and implementation of the mission so through this mission the government is planning to generate 8 lakh crore investments and to create over 6 lakh jobs by 2030 let us see the objectives of the mission through this mission the government aims to produce 5 million metric ton mmt of green hydrogen per annum by 2030 the second objective is to ensure the availability of electrolyzers know that electrolyzers are device where the electrolysis process of the hydrogen production take place and the energy is produced the third objective is the utilization of the green hydrogen see through this mission 
the industries like oil refineries ammonia production they will be mandated to use the green hydrogen in their production processes the last objective is about the export of the green hydrogen see by becoming the global production hub for green hydrogen the government aims to make india a net energy exporter these are all some of the objectives of the national green hydrogen mission so to achieve these objectives the government has announced some serious steps which we are going to see now first one is the site program s i g h t it expands to strategic investments for green hydrogen transition see in this program government has allotted 17490 crores for this program this program aims to achieve two important things the first one is to augment the domestic manufacturing of the electrolyzers we have already saw about the importance of electrolyzers in the production of green hydrogen see the second thing is to ensure the domestic production of hydrogen through this program now let us see the second initiative this initiative is called strategic hydrogen innovation partnership ship this is to facilitate the research and development in green hydrogen technologies through public private partnership ppp here also the government has allotted 400 crore for this initiative the third step is the government aims to develop standards and regulatory frameworks for the quick adoption of the green hydrogen finally the government is focusing on skill development programs to create a skilled workforce for this sector as a whole see these are some important points about national green hydrogen mission so in our discussion we saw about the basics of the hydrogen fuel we also saw about the types of hydrogen on the basis of the mode of production and finally we saw about the flagship scheme of the government national hydrogen energy mission so this is all regarding the news article with this learned point let us take up the next article for our discussion look at this article from the text and context page of the hindu this article talks about a historic referendum which was voted by australians on october 14 this referendum is to decide whether the country's indigenous people should be formally consulted in making laws know that the referendum is nothing but a vote in which all the peoples in the country or an area decide an important question this referendum here poses a question of a proposed law to alter the australian constitution to recognize this indigenous people as the first people of australia and thereby establishing an institution called aboriginal and torres strait islander voice see in this news article discussion let us understand who are the first people of australia and what this referendum seeks to achieve let us start with who are the first people of australia see the first people of australia are the aboriginals refers to the indigenous habitats of the continent they are the people who lived on the australian mainland and its surrounding for tens and thousands of years before the first europeans were who arrived in the 17th century this aborigines reside in the torres strait islands see the location of this island is very important for the prelims examination this strait is a narrow body of water between the northern of the state of queensland and the large island of papua new guinea so having this basics in geography let us move towards the history part of it let us see what is the need of this referendum see the primary reason of this referendum is that the australians 122 year old constitution makes no mention of the aboriginal peoples see this unrecognition is a major identity crisis for the indigenous people of australia secondly let us see about the pathetic situation of the native peoples of australia aboriginal people make about 3.2 percentage of the australian population and they are way below the national averages on the most socio economic measures according to the government booklet indigenous australians have a life expectancy of 8 years shorter than the non indigenous australians and they have the worst rate of disease and infant mortality and the suicide rate of the aboriginals is twice higher than the non indigenous australians thirdly this referendum will be a panacea for the historic injustice which is being done to them so to look into this let us have a rewind of the past see the population of the australian indigenous people 
have reduced significantly after the British colonization since 1788. These people were evicted from their homelands. They were forced to work like slaves and killed by the colonizers. To adding salt to the injury, colonizers enacted Infants Welfare Act of 1935. See, by this act, indigenous children on the Cape Barren Islands were removed from their families. This were done based on the claims of the neglect of children. These children were then placed in the care of non-native families and institutions and thereby separating them from their native culture. Often these children faced child abuses. These laws were applied to thousands of children and for many decades and collectively those children are called the stolen generation. See, Australian government in remembering all these past mistakes appointed a national inquiry in 1997. It was set up to track the stolen generation and it resulted in the report of bringing them home report. Moreover, Australian Parliament issued the statement recognizing and publicly apologizing to the generation who were suffered. So, this referendum tries to give voice to those aboriginal people by enacting them in the legislative process. But sadly, this referendum has failed. A majority of Australians have rejected the proposal. with the final result likely to be about 40% voted yes for the referendum while a overwhelmingly 60% rejected this referendum let us see whether this historical mistakes will be ever corrected by the humanity that's all about the news discussion with this let us move on to the next part of our video that is to discuss the preliminary practice questions today we are having four questions let us solve them one by one see the first question Rajya Sabha does not have members in which of the following committees The first committee is Committee on the Private Members Bill and Resolution Second one is Committee on the Absence of Members Third is General Purpose Committee and fourth is Committee on Petitions See Rajya Sabha does not have members in the Committee on Private Members Bill and Resolution and Committee on the Absence of Members but it does have a members in General Purpose Committee and Committee on Petitions So after eliminating 3 and 4 the correct option is option A. See the next question. Arrange the following UNESCO World Heritage site from north to south direction. See the four UNESCO World Heritage site given here. The first one is Ramappa which we have discussed in our analysis. Second is Hampi, third is Patadakkal, fourth is Mahabalipuram. We have been asked to arrange them from north to south. Here from our common sensical point we can easily say that Mahabalipuram will be coming under in the south okay next there will be three options ramappa hampi and patadakkal we know from our discussion that ramappa lies in telangana so it will be on the north so we can eliminate two options b and d so we are remaining with a and c here patadakkal is in the northern part of karnataka and hampi which is in the south so by going with that logic we can say the order is 1 3 2 4 So the correct option is option C. See the third question. How many of the following pairs are correctly matched? Here one side colors of the hydrogen are given. Second side the process and sources are given. See the black hydrogen is sourced from gasification and coal. So the option is correct. Pink hydrogen it is coming from electrolysis and nuclear energy. So the second statement is correct. See the third statement. Turquoise hydrogen it is coming from pyrolysis and natural gas. and the fourth one is white hydrogen it is the naturally occurring hydrogen so the all the pairs are correctly matched here the correct option is option d see the final question of the day which of the following best describes a referendum in a democratic system see we know from our discussion that there are four types of uh, direct democratic process are there they are initiative recall plebiscite and referendum here referendum is asked see the second statement It's a direct vote by the entire electorate on a specific issue or a proposal which we have discussed in our analysis. So, the correct option is option B. See the main question based on our today's discussion is being listed here. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Thank you for listening. Thank you.